it's going to be fantastic. And so now I turn it over to our esteemed host and moderator, Dr. Leonard Sachs. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Brenda, and welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, yesterday we covered a lot of the scientific and clinical aspects of clinical trials for regulatory uh, submissions. Uh, we spoke about populations and endpoints. We spoke about the analysis. We spoke a little bit about um, special uh, products and so on and so forth. And uh, today we're changing gears uh, and we're going to be looking at clinical trial quality, which is something of great importance to all of us. And I can think of no better person to address this for us than Anne Meeker O'Connor. Uh, O'Connell and is uh, the uh, director of the Office of Clinical Policy. So uh, with no further ado, let's turn it over to Anne. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anne and, and, and I am the Office director of the Office of Clinical Policy in the Commissioner's, in the Commissioner's Office, Office here at FDA. And I'm going to be talking, I'm going to, be talking to, you to you today about integrating quality, integrating quality into clinical and the role trials of clinical and the roles of clinical investigators. So we often think of quality so as an activity that's separate from clinical trials, uh, perhaps a function or a department. In reality, I think quality is the role of everyone involved in a trial, and those serving as a clinical investigator have a particularly important role in delivering quality, as it is your work day to day in engaging participants, in carrying out protocol requirements, and in collecting trial data that really form the bedrock of a trial that yields reliable data and also reliable conclusions. So you'll see the standard disclaimer you've probably heard over the past day that these views and opinions are mine. And what I want to, to do today is to talk about the regulatory perspective on clinical trial quality. We'll also identify the federal regulations that cover clinical research, and particularly those that cover obligations of clinical investigators. We'll touch on common issues seen in FDA inspections of clinical investigators and along with that, we will discuss methods that support compliance with protocol requirements and with the regulations. So if you're looking for a definition of quality, you won't see the word explicitly defined in our investigational new drug or IND regulations, although part of the reason that FDA reviews protocols for IND studies prospectively is to assure that the quality of the scientific evaluation is adequate to permit an evaluation of the drug's effectiveness and its safety. So to understand quality in the context of clinical trials, we need to look to guidance, in this case, ICHE8, uh, which talks about general principles for clinical trials. ICHE8 defines quality as fitness for purpose. And if you think about a clinical trial, its purpose is really to generate reliable information, to answer research questions, and support decision making, and to do that while protecting study participants. So if a trial's purpose is to support product approval, the trial design and data need to be fit for good regulatory decision making. And if, as an investigator, you'll probably also hear reference to good clinical practice, or GCP, as a standard for quality. Those using the term may be referencing global guidance, such as ICHE6, the Good Clinical Practice Guidelines, or they may be referencing regulations. At FDA, we refer to our regulations governing human subject protections and the conduct of clinical trials as our Good Clinical Practice Regulations. But if I had to distill the entirety of GCP down to three things, sort of a Cliff's Note version, if you will, it would be these three, that a trial is well-designed, it's of appropriate scientific quality and the trial design is ethical. Um, there is a due attention to ethics that those conducting the trial adhere to ethical requirements for protection of participants' rights, safety, and welfare, including obtaining IRB review and obtaining informed consent. And that there are reliable data. The trial generates reliable data that can be used to drive decision-making, whether that's by 
a regulator, a clinician, or another party. So those three things, to me, are good clinical practice. So when you think about GCP in that way, it's really clear that there are multiple parties who all play an important um, and interconnected role in trial quality. The sponsors are one the, who design the trials, oversee them, and analyze and report results, as well as um, the contract research organizations who support them in these responsibilities. There are also institutional review boards who play a, a, an important role by providing initial and continuing review and approval of research. And of course, those of you who are clinical investigators who translate a trial from the pages of a protocol into visits in a clinic are critically important. And our regulations talk about who is an investigator. So the clinical investigator on a trial is the individual who actually conducts the clinical investigation. That is, under whose immediate direction the drug is dispensed to a subject. If there is a team, a study team, the investigator is the responsible leader of that team. So as a clinical investigator, you're really at the center of it all. You engage with many different parties across the clinical trial ecosystem. You serve as the key connection point between trial participants and the trial itself. And to be able to start recruiting for that trial, you need to engage with the IRB for their approval, and you need to communicate with them throughout the trial at various points. The sponsor who's conducting the trial has obligations too, including to select qualified investigators to provide them with the information they need to conduct the study appropriately, and also to oversee trial conduct. So that means you'll be engaging with the sponsor and or the CRO staff from initial study startup through it close out. FDA has an important role to play. Uh, we oversee trials. We verify that data submitted to us are reliable and that participants are protected, which we do through both reviews and through on-site inspections. And lastly, if your trial is federally funded, the Office for Human Research uh, Protections, a sister agency in the Department of Health and Human Services, may also be engaged in um, oversight of human subjects protections, focusing on IRBs and uh, informed consent related matters. So that may sound like a lot. And you may be wondering, well, Anne, can I have a co-investigator? The answer is yes and no. For your purposes, you can have a co-investigator, but our regulations don't really recognize the concept of a co-investigator. So each co-investigator would be fully responsible, like a clinical investigator, for fulfilling all the obligations, and each would need to sign a separate form, FDA 1572, uh, uh, a form that we will touch on shortly. Another question that we often get is, does the investigator have to be a medical doctor? Um, and our regulations say that Sponsors need to select investigators who are qualified by training and experience as appropriate experts to investigate the drug. However, it's not required to be a physician. A physician can be a sub-investigator to perform study functions that require um, appropriate medical expertise or qualifications. Some of you in the audience may also aspire to both design and initiate a trial and also to conduct it. That is to play the role of both study sponsor and in clinical investigator. Our regulations define this as a sponsor investigator. In this case, you would need to know and adhere to the regulatory requirements that apply to clinical investigators, which we will walk through in detail during this discussion, as well as those FDA requirements that apply to sponsors. As a sponsor investigator, it's important to be aware that you may also have an obligation outside of FDA's regulations, but one that is enforced by FDA, and that's trial registration and results information submission to the clinicaltrials.gov data bank. This is covered by a regulation codified at 42 CFR Part 11. Now, this is a different Part 11 than FDA's Part 11 focused on electronic records and systems, this Part 11 is a final rule issued by the National Institutes of Health and HHS in 2017. 
And there are some important terms in this rule. Um, so it applies to uh, responsible parties who are the party that must provide information to the clinicaltrials.gov data bank for certain applicable clinical trials. So let's start with who the responsible party is. Under 42 CFR 11, for an applicable clinical trial, this is generally the sponsor of the clinical trial, unless and until a principal investigator has been designated as the responsible party. So under the rule, the clinicaltrials.gov rule, the sponsor for, for a trial is defined as either the uh, investigational new drug application, or IND, holder or the investigational device exemption, or IDE holder. If a trial uh, that's, uh, that meets the requirements for um, submission of information to the clinicaltrials.gov data bank is not conducted under an IDE or IDE, then the sponsor is the single person or entity who initiates the trial and who has authority and control over the trial. So I've mentioned applicable clinical trial. You'll also hear it referred to as ACT as the kinds of the, the trials that are subject to the clinicaltrials.gov rule. So let's talk a little bit more about what an applicable clinical trial is. And this is defined in 42 CFR 11.10. So there are definitions for both applicable drug clinical trial and applicable device clinical trial shown here. Let me walk uh, through the drug definition. So an applicable drug clinical trial is a controlled clinical investigation other than one that is a phase one trial with an FDA regulated drug or a combination product with a drug primary mechanism of action. And I'll note that Controlled here has a specific context. For the purposes of this CT.gov regulation, all interventional trials with one or more arms and one or more pre-specified outcome measures is considered controlled. So this is an important, these are both important definitions. Because if you are the responsible party for an applicable clinical trial, you need to register the trial to the clinicaltrials.gov data bank within 21 days of the first participant being enrolled. And I will note that um, submissions are subject to quality control. Subsequently, the responsible party for an ACT, that is the trial subject to the CT.gov requirements, have to submit results information not later than a year after the trial's primary completion date. There are provisions that allow this date to be extended, but generally speaking, the standard submission deadline is one year post primary completion date. And as with registration information, results submission are also subject to quality control. Uh, so this brings us to our very first challenge question. And I'm gonna be asking you which of the following statements is not true. Is it A, that a uh, phase four interventional trial in the US that's studying an FDA approved drug generally doesn't require submission of results to clinicaltrials.gov? Is it B, that um, applicable clinical trials need to be registered within 21 days of enrolling the first participant? Is it perhaps C, that not all clinical trials are ACTs that um, are subject to the requirements we've been discussing? Or is it D, that both registration and results information that are submitted to CTI.gov are subject to quality control. So let's walk through this. You, you probably remember that both registration and results are subject to, to quality control. So this is true. It's also true that trials must be registered within a 21 day window of enrolling the first participant. So that brings us down to two potential answers, A and C. It is actually true that not all trials are meet the definition of applicable clinical trials. So if you look at all trials registered to clinicaltrials.gov, the majority aren't subject to the regulatory requirements. So C is true. That leaves us uh, with the correct not true answer as A. So let's quickly walk through it. It's not other than a phase one trial. It's studying an FDA regulated product and it's interventional. 
So it likely will meet the controlled clinical investigation definition. You need to look more closely at the details of the trial, but I wouldn't rule it out as being an applicable clinical trial solely because the product is already approved, which is sometimes a misconception. All right, now I want to dive into the FDA requirements for clinical research and for investigators in particular. The legal framework uh, for that FDA operates under um, starts with the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, specifically Section 505I, uh, which provides the statutory authority for our oversight of clinical investigations to test effectiveness and safety of products. The, then, the, then we have regulations um, that are promulgated under Section 505I that describe our authority over clinical investigation conduct. And supporting that are also guidances. So you'll see guidances that we publish. They are non-binding, so they're advisory only, and they're intended to provide FDA's recommendations to assist regulated entities in complying with the regulations outlined in the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, or CFR. What we expect of clinical investigators is simple. We, we expect them to follow the protocol, to know the relevant regulations, to understand their responsibilities and not just know the regulations, but adhere to the regulatory requirements. There are uh, a number of regulations outlined related to good clinical practice and, and clinical trials, and you'll see them on the right side of the screen here. Key for clinical investigators are requirements related to providing financial disclosure at Part 54, um, to obtaining legally effective informed consent from participants at uh, part 50, to ensuring the initial and ongoing review of the study by an IRB, that's part 56, and um, in outlining the out, uh, investigator responsibilities, which are laid out in parts, in sections of parts 312 and 812 for drugs and devices, respectively. For IND studies uh, with investigational drugs, key investigator responsibilities are laid out in the Statement of Investigator Form FDA 1572, or just 1572 for short. So a sponsor has to obtain a completed signed 1572 from each investigator before he or she um, can participate in a clinical investigation regulated by FDA. And I would encourage you to look closely at Section 9, which outlines eight commitments. I'd read them closely and not treat this like, you know, a, a, a EULA for an app that you've downloaded, because each of these commitments highlights a key expectation of the agency. You're agreeing to adhere to the IRB approved protocol with limited exception. You're also agreeing that you'll personally conduct or supervise the study, the latter linking to the obligation to make sure the team supporting you is aware of their obligations to follow the protocol and regulatory requirements. You're also agreeing to make sure participants are appropriately consented in accordance with our human subjects protection regulations, and in particular, that they are aware that the drugs being used are for investigational purposes. Uh, you're also committing that you're aware of the information, particularly the safety information about the product in the investigation or investigational gator brochure, and that you will report adverse events to the sponsor in accordance with the regulations. You're committed to obtaining initial and continuing review and approval of the study from an appropriately constituted IRB and to promptly reporting certain information to the IRB as well. And lastly, you're committing to maintaining adequate, accurate records of the trial. And I want to walk, few, walk through several of these in a little bit more detail. So as you, you probably have noted, these obligations all center on the clinical investigator. Under our regulations, the clinical investigator is in charge and is held accountable for study conduct, including for activities that he or she may delegate to study staff. That really underpins the need to make sure staff and associates supporting trial conduct are aware of their obligations. Because the investigator's obligation to personally conduct or supervise the trial and their obligation to ensure 
staff assisting with the study know their obligations because these two are so critical to trial quality. We've put out guidance with our recommendations on how investigators um, can avoid challenges. And this guidance notes that FDA focuses on four areas when considering investigator oversight. The first is looking at you know, whether those staff members who are delegated study tasks are qualified to, to perform those tasks. So mes many clinical and medical tasks, or most actually, require a formal medical training and may also have licensing or certification requirements, which may vary by jurisdiction. So when you're considering delegation of different study tasks, you need to take into account uh, qualifications and licensing requirements. Because during inspections of sites, FDA has identified instances where study tasks like physical exams or a review of eligibility criteria have been delegated to individuals who aren't appropriately qualified. Second, we want to make sure that the investigator has made sure that staff have an adequate understanding of the specific details of the protocol and different attributes of the investigational product that they need to perform any task assigned to them. And, and generally, the, the investigator should make sure those staff are aware of regulatory requirements and acceptable standards for conducting trials. The next area is supervision. It's been another area of focus in really um, encouraging investigators to make sure they have sufficient time to properly conduct and supervise the trial, taking into account how experienced the team is that you have supporting you, their competing workload, the complexity of the trial design, and any other trials ongoing at your site that may comp compete for attention, among other factors. And lastly, staff involved directly in the conduct of a trial may include individuals who are not in the direct employment of the investigator. For example, a, a site management organization may hire an investigator to conduct a study and provide um, the investigator with a coordinator or other staff that are employed by that site management organization. In that kind of situation, as a clinical investigator, you need to take steps to ensure the staff that aren't in your direct employment are still qualified to perform delegated tasks and have adequate training on carrying out those tasks and, and generally understand the study. So let's turn to some key investigator responsibilities for safety reporting. FDA uh, recently, actually in September of last year, issued a draft guidance on this topic. Responsibilities of clinical investigators include monitoring for occurrence of adverse events and study participants that you've enrolled and evaluating whether the event is serious. Serious adverse events, or SAEs, must be immediately reported to the sponsor. Non-serious events should be recorded and reported to the sponsor according to the protocol requirements. And as an investigator, you also have an obligation to not just look at what's going on at your site, but to review IND safety reports that the sponsor may send you. FDA generally considers a serious and unexpected adverse event that meets the criteria for an IND safety report to be an unanticipated problem involving risk to human subjects or others. So as an investigator, because this is considered an unanticipated problem, you must report such unanticipated problems to your institutional review board. So these responsibilities of the clinical investigator don't function in a vacuum. For safety reporting to work as intended under the regulation, the sponsor, the IRB, and the investigator each have to fulfill their responsibilities and frequently communicate with each other regarding the evolving safety profile of the investigational drug. So this screen shows a high-level basic generalization showing how this process should work for IND safety reporting. This means that the sponsor must evaluate SAEs. They must submit safety, IND safety reports to the FDA and to all participating investigators. The sponsor also has an obligation to evaluate safety signals in the aggregate. Where appropriate, the sponsor must modify the investigator brochure, the protocol, and or the informed consent based on this evolving information. For the sponsor to be able to comply with these requirements, the investigator must identify adverse events, as we just talked about, determine if they're serious, and report them to the sponsor appropriately. Further, the investigator has a continuing duty 
to protect the safety of trial participants. To appropriately do so, they must re review the IND safety reports that the sponsor sends to them. In turn, the investigator must report unanticipated problems, including those arising from IND safety reports to the IRB. And where necessary, the investigator may need to modify the informed consent. They may receive an amended protocol from the sponsor, and these need to be submitted to the IRB for review and approval before they're used. The IRB has obligations as well. The IRB must comply with its obligation to continuously review the research by reviewing the unanticipated problem reports it receives from the investigator. The IRB must follow its written procedures to ensure the safety and well-being of trial participants. And when the, the protocol or the informed consent is modified, the IRB must review and approve it. So this brings me to our next challenge question. Who has responsibility for reporting uh, an unanticipated problem involving risk to human subjects or others to the IRB? Is it the sponsor, the investigator, the contract research organization, or CRO, or all of the above? I hope from what we just talked through that it's become clear to you that uh, the answer is the clinical investigator, or B, who has that obligation as part of the ongoing communication with the IRB to, to let them know about such unanticipated. We just touched on when new in safety information may lead to changes in the informed consent document. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about the informed consent requirements more generally. So under our, our IND regulations at part 31260, the investigator must obtain the informed consent of each human subject to whom the drug is administered, unless certain exceptions are much met, such as the exemption from informed consent requirements for emergency research or ethic requirements at Part 5024. Informed consent must also meet the requirements for required content, and that's in Part 5024. It outlines um, eight basic elements of informed consent with additional elements that um, should be included as relevant to the trial. And these eight basic statements must be in every consent. These are things like the fact that the study involves research, that participation is voluntary, um, things like descriptions of any reasonably foreseeable risks or discomforts to the subject and any benefits to the subject or others which may reasonably be expected from the research. So in addition to the required content in the document, the informed consent process must provide an opportunity for study participants to ask questions and receive answers. And I think that term process is really important. Um, informed consent isn't just a signature or a document. It's a dialogue that in, includes disclosing relevant and adequate information to allow a potential participant to make an informed decision about whether or not the particular trial is appropriate for them. And one of the questions we often get about consent actually relates to signatures, um, and that's whether the investigator has to sign the informed consent form. And the answer to this is under FDA's regulations, no. Um, the ICHE6 Good Clinical Practice Guidelines do indicate that the person conducting the informed consent discussion should sign and date, but that's not part of our regulatory requirements at FDA. If you have other questions or want to um, learn more about consent, we have a draft 2014 guidance that has a wealth of information about the informed consent document, the process, and other ethical considerations. If you're interested in electronic informed consent, we also have a guidance for that. We issued a joint guidance with the Office for Human Research Protections in 2016 um, that promotes and permits the use of various electronic media to obtain and document informed consent, really looking at how, in, in keeping with current technological advances, an electronic informed consent uh, document and process may provide some advantages. It may be uh, obtained on site or remotely for 
a patient, um, this could translate into convenience. They don't have to go to a research site. It may also improve uh, a study participant's engagement. So electronic technologies may be able to engage patients more readily than traditional paper consent forms. And participants may also be more informed. They have the time to review the form at their leisure, allowing them to make uh, a more informed decision, particularly when uh, electronic technologies may supplement consent forms with additional information that um, allow participants to really better understand the research. So again, this is a, a useful Q&A for those of you interested in electronic informed consent. I should note that we're proposing several changes to our informed consent and IRB regulations. These changes respond to a mandate in the 21st Century Cures Act to harmonize the difference, differences between the HHS Human Subject Protection Regulations. You may also hear this referenced as, as the common rule, uh, which governs federally funded and supported research. Um, so it's harmonizing the differences between the common rule and FDA's human subject protection regulations. So that's part 50 and 56 related to consent and IRBs, respectively. And this harmonization is to be done to the extent practicable and consistent with other statutory provisions. So we have issued a series of three proposed rules to date. In 2018, we issued a proposed rule on IRB waiver or alteration of informed consent for certain minimal risk clinical investigations. And this rule is being finalized. The other two proposed rules were published in the Federal Register um, on September 28th. So one, our Institutional Review Board's Cooperative Research proposed rule would require any institution located in the United States that's participating in FDA-regulated multi-site research to rely on approval by a single IRB for that portion of the research conducted in the U.S., with some exceptions. Our Institutional Review Board's and Human Subjects Protection proposed rule uh, would harmonize certain provisions of our regulations at Part 50 and 56 with the common rule. And I wanted to briefly touch on and highlight provisions relevant to informed consent. We propose adopting common rule provisions that we believe can better facilitate potential participants in making decisions about whether a particular trial is appropriate for them. For example, we're proposing changes to the content organization and presentation of information that is included in both the informed consent form and in the process. And this is best exemplified by the inclusion of the revised common rules key information requirement for informed consent. So overall, the intent is for the presentation of information in the document and discussion to be in an organized and understandable manner. We're also proposing to harmonize with the revised common rule by adding a new mandatory element of informed consent that would require a description of how information or biospecimens may be used for future research or distributed to another investigator for future research. And lastly, we're also proposing to add three additional elements of informed consent that mirror additions made in the common rule. So that is a relatively whirlwind tour. I would encourage you to um, review these two proposed rules. Uh, the comment period is open. It closes on December 28th of this year. We welcome written comments, which can be submitted to the dockets that you see here on the screen. Um, that's FDA 2019 N2175 for the cooperative research rule and FDA 2021 N0286 for the proposed rule we've just been discussing that includes uh, proposed changes to informed consent. So let's go quickly through some insights from FDA inspections of clinical investigators. So my intent here is not to highlight just here are some egregious cases, but to identify where we can learn from past mistakes and avoid some of the com common problems that are seen during uh, inspections. So. These inspection data come from CEDAR. You can see that each year we conduct anywhere from uh, th over 300 to around 550 inspections of clinical investigators carrying out trials of FDA regulated drugs. Last year, um, most of these, uh, over 80%, were investigators in the United States. 
but every year there's a substantial proportion conducted across countries globally. I think there were over 50 uh, last year. Each of our inspections receives a final classification, either NAI, no action indicated, which means the, in, the inspected party is generally in compliance, VAI, voluntary action indicated, where an inspection reveals minor deviations from the regulations um, and we're requesting voluntary correction. And then there's official action indicated or OAI, uh, which indicates that there was significant noncompliance identified requiring regulatory or administrative action by FDA. And this slide shows the distribution each year since fiscal year 2012 to fiscal year 2021. You can see that in many cases, uh, inspections result in a no action indicated classification. There's a proportion that are voluntary action indicated and OAI um, every year is, is generally a, a small number, a handful of the, the total inspections. And if you're inspected, you have an opportunity to respond to identified deficiencies before in a final inspection classification made. This can be through verbal discussion when deficiencies are presented at a closeout meeting or in sending a written response to the form FDA 483 that is discussed at, at closeout and presented there. Responses that generally cast blame on others and have a little discussion of actions that address the noted issues and that would prevent recurrence are really unlikely to be persuasive. Uh, for example, if you're, uh, if it's identified that kind of you delegated activities to an independent research company that didn't let you know about violations, um, framing it that way is, is not going to receive a very sympathetic response, given that it's the investigator's responsibilities to make sure that studies are conducted uh, properly and in compliance with regulations. So um, just some considerations for developing a response if you do get a uh, 483. Um, and generally speaking, you should send that written response to FDA within 15 business days of the, the closeout of the inspection at your site. When an inspection has a final classification of OAI, FDA has a number of actions it may take. And this slide shows um, the distribution of those actions, again, from fiscal year 2012 to 2021. So first, we may issue a warning letter. So warning letters are informal and advisory and are not regulatory actions. It, uh, a warning letter identifies the violation, for example, failure to follow the protocol, Letter also makes it clear the inspected party must correct the problem and, and lets people know how and when uh, you need to, res to respond to FDA with your plans for correction. In cases where there is repeated and deliberate failure to comply with the requirements, we may pursue disqualification of an investigator. So there is a NIPPO letter that provides uh, a notice of the matter to the investigator and provides an opportunity to explain uh, through, you know, for example, an informal hearing. And subsequently, there is an opportunity for a formal hearing. And this is what you see on the screen as the uh, NOOH, the Notice of Opportunity for Hearing letter. And at the end of the day, these proceedings may result in an investigator being disqualified and being ineligible to receive investigational drugs. So there are fortunately very few of these. This is the kind of uh, non-compliance submission of false information that may lead to FDA pursuing disqualification. Here, the FDA field investigator interviewed a study subject or participant who indicated he was on site for two visits while the data submitted by the site cover six visits. So four of those were not attended by the subject. That is, they didn't occur. So that being said, most noncompliance is actually due to errors, not to intentional acts. And if we look at last year's uh, inspection outcomes, and actually almost every year since we've done metrics, the most common deficiency in clinical investigator inspections is a simple failure to follow the protocol, uh, followed last year by gaps in records and record keeping. So let's focus on these top two areas. So. In thinking about proactive practices for protocol compliance, these are approaches that some sites have taken to, to avoid protocol noncompliance. 
The first is to appraise the study beyond its scientific interest to really looking at how the study as written could be translated to operations at your site. So thinking through what are the unanticipated, what are the anticipated visits? What's the participant flow through these visits? And is there a different from difference from our standard clinic workflow for similar encounters? Are there things like telephone contacts that wouldn't normally occur that need to be accounted for? It's also thinking about what activities and data are critical to conduct and collect. And are these part of the normal clinical encounter or again, something to plan for? Will there be specialized expertise that you need to engage, for example, a radiologist for certain scans or any special equipment needed for the study? Are there other study specific nuances that differ from other trials? For example, are there adverse events of special interest that aren't SAEs but need to be reported in a different way and perhaps with a, a different timeline than other adverse events? So some sites go beyond this and do try dry runs to double check that there's clarity on roles and responsibilities, that there's sufficient staffing, particularly for activity laden visits, and that there's clarity on how and where study data will be recorded. And once the study is up and running, um, sites that um, are, are as, as, uh, have been more successful in avoiding challenges are, are looking at records in, in near real time to help identify gaps and departures early so that actions can be taken to prevent them from recurring. You know, there is also a focus in recent internationally harmonized guidance, not just on clinical investigators, but on sponsors and how they can help build quality into trial design from the start to avoid the kinds of errors that stem from trial complexity or lack of clarity. Uh, for example, ICHE6, the, our revision two, the Good Clinical Practice Guidelines, included a section on quality management, advising sponsors to uh, ensure that all aspects of the trial are operationally feasible, uh, that the trial isn't unnecessarily complex, and there's also a focus on making sure that all the different elements of an investigational plan, the protocol, study manuals, case report forms, are user friendly, clear and concise, and that information across these documents is consistent. Um, there's a separate ICH guidance, ICH E8, that provides general considerations for clinical trials that was recently updated to revision one, and it includes uh, a description of the concept of quality by design, a really focusing on the critical aspects of the trial, the things that most go right to have credible and reliable data and to protect participants, and focusing on this at the time of design. And, and why, why are we kind of pointing sponsors to the time of design? That's because that's the point when you can not only identify a critical aspect of trial design, but take steps by tailoring the design to avoid the kinds of errors that impact regulatory decision making. Protocol design and development is also an opportunity to ask, why, do we including, why are we including this data collection or this activity? And to streamline the trial where feasible. It's also uh, a point where the outcomes of these protocol design stage reviews can be translated to efficient, focused trial imp implementation and oversight. So the risk-based quality management and monitoring that's in FDA and other regulatory authority guidance. So let's walk through an example of how this could help both sponsor and investigator this proactive assessment of a protocol before starting to conduct it. In this case is thanks to my colleagues in Cedar's Office of Scientific Investigation. So this was a marketing submission that had a large, randomized, blinded, placebo-controlled cardiovascular outcome study with MACE as the primary endpoint, and that there was an independent adjudication committee for that endpoint. And so the study was powered based on the predicted number of primary endpoint events. And during inspection, a site was flagged for a look because of their large enrollment and of data trends suggesting underreporting of primary efficacy and safety events. And on inspection, and during record review, there were multiple examples identified that appeared consistent with a MACE event, but were adjudicated negatively by the independent adjudication committee. And the CI noted that when events occurred outside of the site's network, it was nearly impossible for 
him or his staff to obtain requested records needed by the adjudication committee due to the, quote, litigious climate of that particular community. And so this had an impact. It had an impact for the sponsor, needing to reestimate sample size, substantially increasing enrollment uh, with subsequent increased costs and trial length. And you start to think, you know, hindsight is 2020, but were there things that could have been prevented had this concept of quality of better design been applied during the design and planning of the study? And the answer is potentially. The sponsor might have considered global differences in site practices that would have revealed this is a risk requiring mitigation. For example, in considering how and where the endpoint might be documented. A site could have done a dry run or walkthrough and identified the need to obtain of documents from external institutions, the fact that this was a particularly hairy challenge. This would have allowed discussions and plans for mitigation before participants were enrolled and avoided the types of challenges seen. So let's quickly walk through records, which also came up in our frequent flyer top two findings. Our regulations discuss record retention by clinical investigators, outlining the time periods for retention. They also talk about what types of records investigators need to be uh, maintained, including adequate records of drug disposition, accurate case histories that record all observations and other data pertinent to the investigation on each individual that gets the study drug or that's employed as a control. So you may be wondering about the image on the right. That's my mom. She was a nurse and I think should be your guiding light for record keeping and retention. She thought proactively about what she might need to document and retain, albeit for the purpose of embarrassing me decades later. She kept it. She knew where it was and she could provide it as a moment's notice. You could do similar. Look at the protocol, determine data and observations that are required, how the study drug is managed, and think about where will it all be captured and how will it all be captured? Um, and that avoids those simple errors that can create significant challenges. Lastly, there's an art to how you document. ICH E6R2 recommends that trial data be recorded following the ALCOA C principles. So data need to be attributable, you know, who made the entry, contemporaneous, captured at the time of activity, original and accurate, and also legible. And this is where my mom fails. Her handwriting was, well, let's just say a challenge. ICH also recognizes that we sometimes make mistakes. There are data entry errors, but any changes should be traceable. If you're thinking and familiar with computer systems, this is analogous to the concept of an audit trail. And that is our quick tour. I just want to recognize the really crucial role clinical investigators play in ensuring trial quality. And those of you who are sponsor investigators may have additional responsibilities. And a key one is really including uh, transparent reporting of results for applicable clinical trials. Both clinical investigators and sponsor investigators need to ensure that staff have a clear understanding of the protocol and their responsibilities and directions and to really uh, appropriately supervise staff because at the end we all suffer if the public loses confidence in trial integrity. Conversely, trials that are designed well, conducted well, and that respect participants and that are ultimately reported transparently build public confidence encourage broad participation, and that ultimately yields safe and effective products. I'll just close here by leaving you with this. A small amount of time devoted to planning can avoid days and months of remediation. Quality is never an accident. It is the result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for uh, a beautifully organized lecture. I think you've covered an enormous amount of ground, and I'm sure the audience will agree that uh, this was really very satisfying. Um, I know that there are uh, a horde of questions in the chat, and I think I'm going to turn over you to uh, begin answering them as you can, uh, and I may sort of uh, participate from time to time if there's something uh, else that I can add. Uh, we'll have the session for uh, approximately 15 minutes and then we'll move on to the next one.
So, Anne, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Leonard. Um, and thanks to everyone who has logged in. I've been looking at where everyone's from, so you know, probably many different times of day, and I appreciate all of the questions that have come in. Um, what I wanted to start with, I tried to, I've been looking through them, and I found, uh, like, I'm trying to kind of bunch them, so to speak. So let me start with some questions that we got related to um, the clinicaltrials.gov data bank registration um, and results information submission uh, requirements. So um, I think um, there was a question just to clarify at what stage uh, the responsible party, which again is generally speaking the sponsor of the trial, or in some cases uh, a, a delegated or designated principal investigator, what stage are they required to register the trial? Um, so it is within 21 days of enrolling the first subject. And I think the question was also why register? I think I would say in addition to um, the regulatory requirements for registration and results reporting for applicable clinical trials, there's also benefits from a transparency perspective. It can make um, patients aware of trials that might be available, that might be of interest to them. It can avoid duplication of research by um, building awareness of what's gone before. Um, so we also had a question because the uh, results information submission links to the primary completion date of the trial within a year of the primary completion date uh, of what's the primary completion date uh, for um, an applicable clinical trial. And so the primary completion date is defined as the date that the final participant was examined or received an intervention for the purposes of final collection of data for the primary outcome. And that's whether the trial um, concluded according to the pre-specified protocol or was terminated. Um, so if there's a, a trial with more than one primary outcome measure with different completion date, then the term refers to the date on which data collection is completed for all the primary outcomes. So, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of what I would encourage people who have an interest in um, the clinicaltrials.gov and the requirements surrounding it to um, look at the clinicaltrials.gov website. There's really a wealth of information there that our colleagues at NIH have provided. Um, they have kind of links to the final rule. There are um, different um, tools. There's you know, links to webinars that have been held that really kind of um, dive into some of the requirements in, in a lot more detail. Um, so we would encourage you to, 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 to use that as a resource. Um, let me turn to some questions we had about kind of co-investigators. And I think um, just to clarify, that's not a term that's included in FDA's regulation. So it, it's, you know, sometimes we get asked questions about can I, you know, can there be two leaders of the team, so to speak? And the answer from a regulatory perspective is each of those individuals would be considered a separate clinical investigator. Uh, so co-investigator wasn't intended to refer to a sub-investigator, um, but um, those situations where uh, people desire to have kind of a, somebody else helping to lead the team. And the ultimate responsibility for choosing qualified investigators lies with the sponsor, which I think was another question. Um, let me and I, just wanted to, I wanted to interject for a section. Uh, I don't know if it appears in the questions, but another uh, term is principal investigator, which again does not seem to be part of our lexicon. Do you want to comment on that before we leave the question? Absolutely, I'm happy to, um, because I think, so principal investigator is a term, you know, I think it's frequently used in, um, you'll see it um, if you engage with NIH and other parties. In fact, it appears in the um, clinicaltrials.gov regulation. So, you know, to my mind, it is the equivalent of our clinical investigator. So it is the responsible leader of, of a team of people who, that may include 
um, sub-investigators and other study staff. Um, so thank you for um, reminding me to clarify that because it can be, um, you know, it, it could seem confusing. Um, you know, we have gotten a question about, um, you know, can you update a 1572? And we often get the question of when do I need an updated uh, 1572? So there are, generally speaking, um, two cases in which you would be required to have an updated 1572. That's when you have a new protocol and the investigator is participating in a new trial. So it's essentially a new clinical trial and a new uh, new uh, clinical investigator site. The second would be when there um, is a new clinical investigator. So they are um, there's either a new site um, added to a study or there is a change in the clinical investigator um, at a site. Um, so the 1572 itself, doesn't need to be revised to capture changes in sub-investigators, changes in IRB addresses, other changes. I think kind of our, our guidance is that the investigators should capture that in their clinical study records and sponsors um, should accumulate changes and submit, um, submit those in information or protocol amendments to the IND, but um, the, the form itself doesn't need to be updated and, and re-signed. So there's also a question about um, whether uh, about 1572s and device studies. So 1572s are part of our IND regulation. So if a, a study is not under an IND or it is conducted under an IDE or for a device, the sponsor of a device study, uh, the 1572 isn't required, but the sponsor of a device study needs to obtain a signed investigator agreement, which has information similar to what you find in a 1572. Um, and that's under the device regulations at 812.43, I think. Um, I think I'm trying to think of some other common 1572 questions. I think um, we also um, get questions about whether the 1572 has to be submitted to FDA. And the answer is no. The sponsor is required to collect the signed 1572 from um, each uh, participating investigator, but FDA doesn't require the form to be submitted um, to us. Many sponsors do because it collects information that needs to be um, submitted to FDA under our IND regulations, but the 1572 itself is not required to be submitted. Um, so let me keep moving on through some other questions, unless unless you have questions that uh, you wanted to jump in on, Leonard, or anything in particular related, related to the 1572. I'll just pause um, for a second. Yeah, I think the other thing that sort of raises a lot of issues is uh, who is a sub-investigator sub to put on the 1572. Do you have any insights on that, Anne? I do. Um, so, you know, that is a common question. So the decision to include um, somebody as a, as a sub-investigator in, in field or box six on the form really depends on the level of responsibility that individual has for the trial. So in general, if an individual uh, makes a direct substantive contribution to the trial data, they should be in that box. I don't know if you have anything else you would add to that, Leonard? No, I think that's perfect. Thanks. Yeah, and you're reminding me that um, we sometimes, uh, you know, uh, get questions about foreign investigators um, in 1572s, and for trials that are under INDs, um, then the IND requirements need to be met. So there are cases where local laws or regulations may prohibit an investigator um, from signing. Uh, a 1572, and in those cases, um, sponsors can submit requests to FDA for a waiver of, of uh, IND requirements under 312.10. We actually have a draft information sheet from May of 2021 of frequently asked questions on the 1572 that provides a, a lot more information um, you know, on that topic. So it would, again, 
encourage people to, to leverage the guidance um, that we have out there, which um, brings me to another question that I saw, which was, can I explain the difference between the Code of Federal Regulations or CFR and ICH GCP? So our, our Code of Federal Regulations are, are rules, so they're requirements, they're, they are kind of binding. ICH, um, the documents that come out of ICH, including ICH E6, really function as FDA guidance. Um, if you recall, kind of in that hierarchy of uh, statute to uh, regulation to guidance being kind of FDA's uh, recommendations. Um, let me keep, keep looking. Um, and you know, again, Leonard, if there's something in particular um, that you see that is um, you know, a common question, I am more than kind of happy to jump in. Um, you know, just to, to you know, clarify something I said earlier that you know, our regulations require uh, investigators, the clinical investigator, to be qualified by kind of education and experience to be experts in evaluating a drug. It doesn't have to be a medical doctor, but um, you know, it, given that um, most trials of, uh, if not all trials of investigational um, medicines, uh, you know, drugs, biologics, and um, of devices have um, require, you know, have activities in them that require um, medical training and certification. I think um, that's why uh, you heard me say that a, uh, a somebody who is medically qualified should be, uh, if the if the clinical investigator is not uh, a clinician, that somebody with appropriate medical qualifications should be a, a sub investigator to be able to carry out those responsibilities that require that training. Um, I am, you have many, many questions, and these are all great. I wish I could, uh, I wish we had, you know, we, we had hours, but I'm just going to um, touch on one thing. We've had a number of questions. This goes back to clinicaltrials.gov about phase one trials. So um, the, the requirements in the rule, um, you know, are for, for applicable drug clinical trials are other than phase one. Um, so while, uh, so I will highlight that there are some nuances for trials. Sometimes trials get labeled um, phase one slash two um, that um, you know, are, out, are account, uh, outlined in the rule. Um, but in general, uh, phase one trials would, uh, would not be an applicable clinical trial. Um, under the, the um, clinicaltrials.gov regulation. Um, let's see. I uh, continuing to to kind of make sure I get um, trying to find common questions um, so that uh, we can uh, I can make sure to kind of get to to them. Um, so there was a question of can the uh, CRC, I'm assuming you're meaning clinical research coordinator, sign the consent form um, if uh, the CRC is conducting a consent interview. Um, and you know, I think, as I mentioned, our regulations don't require um, the investigator or somebody delegated that responsibility from the investigator, which could be a CRC, to, to sign the consent form. Um, but that is in the ICH um, E6 guidelines. Certainly, if the the uh, CRC um, is conducting a consent interview and um, you know, is aware of the protocol, has been delegated that. I mean, there's nothing there's nothing that would prohibit them from signing the form. But just to, to wanted to clarify that from a FDA's regulations, it's it, that signature would not be a requirement. Um, let's see. And then, sorry, Leonard, were you going to jump in? I thought I heard a, something. Yeah, um, maybe just a comment on sub-investigators. You know, investigators have a lot of responsibilities that are referred to in the regs, 
what about sub-investigators? Is that something you can address? I know we only have a minute. Yes, I'll speak quickly. Um, so mm -hmm. I think the sub-investigators, um, you know, if you are a sub-investigator, you you need to know your obligations. You know, I think there's a, we, we look to the clinical investigator to make sure the team that's supporting them is aware of the protocol requirements um, and kind of their obligations. And I think the expectation for sub-investigators would be that, you know, they are you know, following the protocol. They're carrying out the, the, the responsibilities that a clinical investigator has delegated to them appropriately, consistent with the protocol um, and with the regulatory requirements. Uh, because I think, you know, if you think about kind of a, 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 a site, and uh, you know, everyone on that study team is, and, and particularly some investigators making a substantial contribution to the trial are really um, also very important in the overall uh, quality. Um, so perhaps I can ask one question I, I, we haven't got, but I often get, which is how can I prepare for an inspection? I'm a clinical investigator and I think I'll just say the key is not to start preparing when it's announced. Um, again, some of what I discussed earlier can help you in, sub in really understanding kind of what the critical aspects of the protocol. Um, but uh, I wanted to make sure people um, knew there are things like our compliance program manuals. These are, um, there are different types. They are kind of directed at the field investigators who conduct inspections. And there's one for clinical investigators and sponsor investigators that I think if you look at, um, it's, uh, they're available online. They're called CPMs. Um, this particular one is 7348.811. Um, it'll give you a good idea of what's looked at and what's evaluated when you have an FDA uh, field investigator out on site. So I think we're probably out of time. I really enjoyed kind of being able to participate in all of your questions, and I thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Anne. It's been a terrific session. I'm sure the audience, uh, if they were able to, would be applauding. Um, we're going to change gears a little now, uh, and we're going to look at a new um, aspect of clinical trials. These are sort of technological and information technology opportunities and uh, new initiatives to make trials more efficient or uh, to improve their uh, reach. So um, I'm very happy to have my colleague John Concarta from my office as well uh, to start off talking about real world evidence. And uh, after that, I'll give a short talk about uh, innovative trial designs, including decentralized clinical trials and digital health technologies. And then the two of us will be available for a 15 minute question and answer session. So, John, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Hello, I'm John Pincato from the Office of Medical Policy in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, and I'll be discussing real world evidence. The views and opinions expressed are mine and should not be attributed to the Food and Drug Administration. I do not have any conflicts of interest related to this presentation and mention of commercial products should not be construed as an actual or an implied endorsement. As objectives and an outline of the presentation, I'll first describe the scope of FDA's Real World Evidence Program. I'll move on to recognize the intersection of scientific and legal and regulatory issues related to study design in the real world evidence era. Next, we'll interpret terms commonly used for study design and drug development and then we'll move to identifying examples of real world evidence in drug approvals. Let's start with the 21st Century Cures Act of 2016, which prompted FDA to establish a program to evaluate the potential use of real world evidence to support a new indication for a drug already approved or to satisfy post approval study requirements. A draft real world evidence framework was issued in December of 2018, and draft guidance for industry was issued in late 2021. It's important to note that our standard for substantial evidence remains unchanged, and we can also mention that commitments were met under the Prescription Drug User Fee Act 6, and there is a new Advancing Real World Evidence Initiatives Program 
in Purdue for Seven that started in October of this year. FDA has formal real-world definitions from our 2018 framework. On the left, we see real-world data or data related to patient health status for delivery of health care routinely collected from a variety of sources. We often think of electronic health records, medical claims, registries, and the other sources shown. On the right, we see that real-world evidence is defined simply as the evidence regarding the usage and potential benefits risks of a medical product derived from the analysis of real-world data. And note that randomized trials can generate real-world evidence when they incorporate real-world data. The 2018 Real-World Evidence Framework applies to the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, as well as the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research and the Oncology Center of Excellence, but not to other centers. The program involves internal agency processes, external stakeholder engagement, demonstration projects, and guidance development, although I only have time to discuss the last two of these four components. This slide shows the title pages of the four draft guidances published in late 2021. The left-hand side shows two real-world data source guidances involving electronic health records and medical names on the top, as well as registries on the bottom left. In the upper right, we have a guidance on data standards for drug and biologic product submissions, and in the lower right, last but not least, we have what we call our regulatory considerations guidance. Let's now turn our attention to study design, starting with traditional terms used to describe patient-oriented research for several decades. On the left, we see descriptive studies, including case reports and case series. And on the right, we have cause and effect or analytic studies with a control or comparative group which are usually described either as observational studies or what could be called experimental studies, but with an intact patient as a unit of observation for all intents and purposes, randomized trials are the most common experimental study design. When considering randomized studies to evaluate drug outcome associations, we see that we have patients at baseline who receive a drug or a comparator who are then evaluated for an outcome. When we ask the question whether the validity of the comparison is affected by sources of methodologic bias, we recognize that randomization promotes balance at baseline to have minimized bias. And for decades, randomized trials have been the preferred method for evaluating drug safety and efficacy. This second of two design slides shows non-randomized studies where a patient's at baseline again receive a drug or a comparator, but this time in usual clinical practice, and an evaluation of outcome is subsequently done. Is the validity of this comparison affected by sources of methodologic bias? Well, observational studies need to address baseline imbalances to minimize bias, such as accounting for the drug of interest being given preferentially to patients who are more likely to have either better or worse outcomes. A topic related to the prior two slides is shown here. Most, if not all of you, have seen this or similar hierarchies of study design, which evolved in the 1990s, designating randomized control trials as a gold standard study design and suggesting other study designs are not trustworthy. More recently, however, emphasis has been placed on strengths and limitations of different study design types. One view is represented by an article titled The Magic of Randomization versus the myth of real-world evidence. The article has the quote, because of potential biases in observational studies, such studies cannot generally be trusted. The replacement of randomized trials with non-randomized observational analyses is a false solution to the serious problem of ensuring that patients receive treatments that are both safe and effective, close quote. I'll just mention here that few, if any, people are suggesting the replacement of randomized trials. Nonetheless, in contrast, we have a misunderstanding randomized trial article that argues, quote, any special status for uh, randomized trials is unwarranted. Which method is likely to yield a good causal inference depends on what we are trying to discover, as well as on what is already known, close quote. Several CEDAR staff publish on this topic in an article titled, Randomized, Observational, Interventional, and Real World, What's in a Name? The take-home points include 
that FDA is evaluating whether and how observational studies intended to evaluate efficacy can contribute persuasive results from scientific and regulatory perspectives. And in this context, a randomized trial versus observational study dichotomy is overly simplistic as shorthand for strength of study design to support causal inferences. Additional comments are also shown in this excerpt. To better understand the term real world evidence, we should begin with the term big data, which first appeared in the computer science literature during the 1990s, often referring to data too large to be stored in then conventional storage systems. It's unclear when big data became the buzzword of the day or really what it exactly means, but one perspective is that the integration and analysis of large scale data has always been integral to epidemiology, but what's changed is that modern technology has increased the quantity and forms of available data, as well as the speed to manipulate and merge such data. If we focus on the term real world evidence, we should recognize that real world is actually a nonspecific modifier and real world data and real world evidence appeared in the medical literature as early as the 1970s or before that even, but in various contexts. In contemporary usage, however, RWD and RWE have formal regulatory definitions as I described. So one perspective is that the older epidemiologic terms were sufficient, but the emergence of big data and the enactment of 21st Century Cures Act has led to what turns out to be sometimes confusing use of different taxonomies for study design. As just one example, when you hear real world evidence study, don't automatically think of an observational study. You really need to hear specific details to classify the study design. With that background, we could look at contemporary terms for study design. Please think of interventional studies, also known as clinical trials, as studies in which patients are assigned to one or more treatment groups according to a study protocol. Both randomized controlled trials and even single arm trials would be in this group. Non-interventional or observational studies involve studies where patients are not assigned to a study arm according to a research protocol, but instead receive the drug of interest during routine medical practice. Here we see observational cohort studies and case control studies as an example. In the third category, we have combinations of interventional and non-interventional components, such as externally controlled trials, where a single arm trial is combined with data from another source. Those same terms were used in an article from earlier this year titled Real World Evidence, Where Are We Now? You see in the top row randomized interventional studies, non-randomized interventional studies, and non-randomized non-interventional studies. We tend, however, to jump down to the next row to talk about traditional randomized trials, trials in practice settings, externally controlled trials, and observational studies, with the main body of the figure showing different design types. It's also important to note that the generation of real-world evidence does not occur when a traditional randomized trial uses real-world data only for planning purposes on the left, such as to assess enrollment criteria or to support selection of trial sites. And there is an increasing reliance on real-world data going left to right, and we do finally catch up with the observational study category on the far right. Let's now segue to FDA's approach to evaluating real world evidence. Key considerations are summarized here. First, whether the real world data are fit for use. Second, whether the study design can generate adequate scientific evidence to answer the regulatory question. And third, whether the study conduct itself meets FDA regulatory requirements. Given what I've described, it shouldn't come as a surprise that what we now call real world evidence has been the basis for drug approvals for years. This slide shows as column headings a drug, indication, approval date, and the data source views. Notice that the approval column goes from 2010 to 2015 prior to the 21st Century Cures Act. And let's just look at the third row, Blincido or Blinitumumab for the treatment of ALL. The drug was approved in 2014 based on data from a single arm trial compared to patient level data from chart review of patients at European Union and US sites. This is an externally controlled trial with a real world data source, which constitutes real world evidence. This next slide shows approvals during the 21st century cures era with examples from 2016 through 2019, including the fourth row, Zolgensma, where data from a single arm trial compared to data in an external control group based on a natural history study were the basis for approval. 
A final and more recent example is a new indication for a drug called Prograf based on real-world evidence. The drug Tocolimus had been approved for prophylaxis of organ rejection in patients receiving liver, later kidney and heart transplants based on traditional randomized trial evidence, and the drug was being used widely in clinical care. For various reasons, randomized trials were not done for lung transplant, but the sponsor submitted a supplemental new drug application to FDA with a non-interventional quote-unquote real-world evidence study. The data and design were evaluated according to FDA standards, and approval for preventing rejection and death in lung transplant was granted in July of 2021. Applying the consideration shown on an earlier slide to the PROGRAF approval, we see that the data came from the U.S. Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients involving all lung transplants in the U.S. during the period shown. The design was a non-interventional observational treatment arm compared to historical controls. And FDA determined this study to be adequate and well-controlled, or highest evidence bar. Of note, the outcomes of organ rejection and death are virtually certain to occur without therapy, and this dramatic effective treatment helped to preclude bias as an explanation of results. In summary, FDA's real-world evidence program is advancing as outlined in the agency's 2018 framework for real-world evidence. It's important to recognize that new terminology linked to the emergence of big data and the passage of 21st century cures is often used inconsistently, and randomized trials versus observational studies is an oversimplified dichotomy. It's also true that older terms of study design and drug development are now joined by newer terms describing those same study designs. But regardless, FDA approves drugs and biological products using real-world evidence based on applicable and existing regulations maintaining our evidentiary standards. Finally, a knowledge check. True or false, randomized trials are not within the scope of real-world data, real-world evidence at FDA. This statement is false. Randomized trials generate real-world evidence when they incorporate meaningful real-world data. The second statement, real-world evidence studies for effectiveness are held to a different, that is, lower evidentiary standard than randomized trials. The statement is, is also false. Regardless of the type of study design, the FDA has specific standards for judging whether a product is safe and effective for use. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the question and answer discussion period. We're going to spend the next half hour discussing some innovative trial approaches, uh, including digital health technologies, and decentralized clinical trials. I think we all recognize that there's been significant progress in biosensor development and in communication technologies, and the opportunities for remote collection of data are quite remarkable. These technologies, as we know, are playing an ever-increasing role in clinical care, and digital health technologies and electronic communication platforms can obviously perform a significant role in the evaluation of medical products. Why bother with these technologies and approaches? This is a child with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. As many of you know, Duchenne's is an inherited condition in young boys. Uh, it results in progressive muscle weakness, uh, eventually tragically resulting in death, usually from respiratory failure when patients reach their teens. And uh, this boy is participating in a clinical trial. In order to get to his trial visits, he has to be taken out of school. His mother has to take time off work. Uh, a flight has to be booked. They have to get onto the flight, transport the wheelchair, get into a hotel, and eventually get to the trial site. A very arduous and disruptive process. When they get to the trial site, this is what gets done. This is the six minute walk test and uh, the child is supervised and the child is told to walk as far as he can for six minutes and the distance is measured. It certainly leaves us scratching our heads. This is an example of an accelerometer. These are tiny electronic devices. Usually they're used, uh, three of them are used in mutually perpendicular directions and they can provide a very good representation of many types of uh, movement and activity.
accelerometers of versatile tools for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and for many other diseases. Accelerometers are used all over. They're present in our cell phones, in our smartwatches and Fitbits. Triaxial accelerometers give a good three-dimensional picture of movement, as I mentioned, and they can be very helpful in measuring steps or measuring other activities taken by a Duchenne's patient. There's no need to depend on snapshot measurements and uh, clumsy tests like the six-minute walk test. Uh, measurements can be recorded over long periods of time and comparisons can be made with baseline measurements. They capture objective data on functionality, which has traditionally been challenging in clinical trials. They may be useful in neuromuscular and cardiorespiratory diseases, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's disease, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and pulmonary hypertension. And they have a potential role in neuropsychiatric diseases, depression, ADHD, and schizophrenia, which are difficult to measure using current methods. As far as biosensors go, they measure clinical features, and these may either be discrete events like a step, a breath, a cough, a pulse beat, a seizure, a tremor, or forced expiratory volume, or they may be continuous readings like we get from a continuous glucose monitor, glucose readings, pulse oximetry, temperature readings, electrocardiograms, and blood pressure. Uh, biosensors uh, begin as a transducer, an electronic device that transforms a physical finding like acceleration or temperature or pressure into an electrical output. The, uh, as you can see, there are a number of different types of transducers that we see in use, galvanometers, accelerometers, photoelectric cells, electrochemical sensors, and thermocouples all detect different physical properties. The output, as I mentioned, is some electric output, which might be either voltage, current, or impedance. And um, if these are intended to measure a clinical feature, for example, things like heart rhythm, walking, scratching, tremor, or blood oxygen saturation, etc., uh, an algorithm is needed to process the data. Sometimes the algorithm includes uh, calibration curves, which are needed in electrochemical sensors. And the result of the uh, sensor and the algorithm is a clinical uh, digital health technology. As you can see there, a cardiac monitor, an activity tracker, pulse oximeter, continuous glucose monitor, and a digital thermometer. I mentioned before that we can measure discrete events or we can make continuous measurements depending on how the algorithms are designed. Discrete events may be things like steps. Uh, continuous measurements, things like continuous gluco me glucose measurements. An important question is whether we can rely on the DHT, and uh, verification and validation are two uh, industry standards for making sure that the DHT is fit for purpose. Verification is generally a lab process, and uh, it answers the question as to how accurate and precise the DHT is in measuring the targeted feature? Is it reliable in different environments, temperature and humidity? Does the algorithm used to interpret the raw electric signal reliably represent the clinical characteristic or event that we are trying to capture? For example, steps or breaths. Validation is usually done in the field and the intent of validation is to show how suitable the DHT is for its intended use. Are the data recorded by the digital health technology in the patients the same as the data we would report if we were looking at the patient? For example, steps in a patient with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or steps in a patient shuffling with Parkinson's disease. Is the result affected by how the patient wears or uses the DHT? And are there other things that a patient might do that would be misinterpreted by the DHT? For example, tapping a foot or riding a bike. Usability is also an important consideration. Uh, is the DHT ugly or elegant? Will patients be happy wearing it? Is it easy to put on? Is it easy to operate? Is it comfortable to wear for the required duration of the study? Is the battery life convenient? Can it be synced? And uh, are you allowed to bring your own device? Is it suitable for use by patients? Is it suitable for measurement by patients' own devices?
I wanted to end this discussion on digital health technologies by mentioning that mobile applications are also considered DHTs. And here you can see a couple of examples. A patient reported outcome on a cell phone, a cell phone camera that's used to capture a lesion, a coordination test in Parkinson's disease on the top right. This test has two buttons on the cell phone and the patient's required to alternatively tap each of the buttons to test their coordination. And finally, things like visual tests on a cell phone. What about endpoints based on DHT measurements? Justification of the endpoint is important as a clinically meaningful measure of drug effect. When we think of the endpoint, it has various components. The first is what is being measured, for example, steps. What is the time window of observation? Let's assume this is four weeks. And what is the formula for the response in each patient? Which in this case may be changed from week one to week four in the average daily step count. Another question is whether the endpoint is, clinically meaning, is a clinically meaningful measurement of drug effect. And this can be established by comparison with existing benchmarks of performance, for example, things like the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale or other patient reported outcomes, the six minute walk distance. It would also be very important to get input from patients, from caregivers, professional societies, disease experts and regulators regarding the meaningfulness of the endpoint. I put the slide in just to remind ourselves of the differences between validation and verification versus justification of an endpoint. I think it's important to remember that validation and verification are technological assessments. They address how well the technology measures the clinical feature of interest. On the other hand, justification of an endpoint or a clinical outcome assessment is a clinical issue. It addresses how well the clinical feature of interest represents a meaningful response to treatment. And it has nothing to do with the DHT or with the method of measurement. Where are digital health technologies likely to be of use in drug development? And what I've done here is summarize the endpoints that we used in registrational trials between 2015 and 2020. You can see that there were 218 new drug applications during this period. And about 30% of them shown in Bayes relied on a uh, biomarker, for example, a chemistry measurement like hemoglobin A1C, pregnancy test in um, contraceptives or GFR, hematology tests, pathology tests and microbiology tests. About 22% relied on imaging. Uh, a lot of these were cancer trials where imaging was part of pro progression-free survival assessments. Uh, but there were other applications uh, that looked at bone mineral density or vertebral fractures and spleen volume. About 7% uh, focused on physiological or functional measurements. These included things like the six minute walk distance, uh, normal sinus rhythm, forced expiratory volume or sleep studies. 22% uh, uh, relied on clinical events or clinical signs, and these were generally prophylactic studies. There were studies designed to prevent things like death, hospitalization, major adverse cardiac events, or multiple sclerosis relapse. And finally, 32% relied on clinician reported outcomes or patient reported outcomes. And these were things like the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, Rheumatology Scales, uh, psoriasis, severity indices, seizures, sleep, prostate symptoms, and other scores. So there are many types of endpoints where mobile technology tools may play a role. Uh, first of all, as we saw, clinical lab measurements, continuous glucose monitoring and pulse oximetry are some of the obvious ones. Physiological measurements like heart rate and rhythm, breathing and lung function, seizures, syncope, temperature and weight. And finally, performance assays, things like stamina, strength, coordination, abnormal movements, sleep and cognition. Advantages of these type of continuous readings by biosensors are uh, richer data instead of snapshot data. For example, we can get things like the average number of steps a patient takes to a day versus the six minute walk distance. Uh, continuous glucose monitoring versus just a single hemoglobin A1C and diabetes. Uh, 
they give us the ability to detect rare events like arrhythmias, seizures or apneic spells. We can get data from patients who cannot report, for example, scratching in infants with atopic dermatitis or sleep patterns in patients with dementia. We can get dose response information, for example, the on-off effects of treatment in Parkinson's disease. And we can also make new types of measurements that weren't possible before. For example, accelerometry measurements of gait stability that may predict falls in patients with mo movement disorders, measurements of coughing, sneezing and tremor, and behavior patterns in patients with dementia or depression. Uh, DHTs can be used for things other than endpoints. They can be used for enrollment, screening and enrichment, helping qualify a baseline disease severity and functional status. They can be used to monitor certain aspects of safety, for example, identification of rare adverse events, and they can also provide uh, investigators with real-time access to patient safety data. They allow visualization of dose responses over the dosing interval. And finally, as far as endpoints go, their use would be most compelling in superiority studies, which show that one arm is better than another. Non-inferiority studies may be challenging to interpret. If the uh, DHT is not working properly, it may give us the false impression that both arms are equally effective. Uh, what is our regulatory position on digital health technologies? We don't have regula regulations that directly address the use of DHTs in clinical trials. Um, DHTs in clinical trials generally do not need to be approved or cleared by FDA for marketing unless they are medical devices. Uh, our regulatory standard are the qualities of the data from a DHT adequate to provide substantial evidence of effectiveness. And finally, are the data attributable to the patient are there processes in place to ensure the data integrity, data security in transit and during storage? And you can uh, refer to our uh, guidance on the use of electronic health records and electronic signatures and clinical investigations uh, listed below for more details on part 11 as it applies to uh, data integrity. Now let's turn our attention to decentralized clinical trials. Um, decentralized clinical trials are really a package of strategies. These are trials where some or all of the trial related activities take place remote from the investigator at a place or location that's convenient for patients and that do not require visits to research site. Uh, they include, the strategies include video and telemedicine visits, the use of digital health technologies, uh, direct distribution of the product to patients' homes, the use of electronic informed consent so that patients can sign their consent at home, the use of home visits by either clinical staff or local healthcare providers, and of course the use of local healthcare providers themselves and facilities to provide some of the data used in the clinical trial. Why are regulators interested in decentralized clinical trials? Well, firstly, accessibility. This would be very important in patients with rare diseases who are widely spread across the country or across the world. Second of all, for patients with mobility or cognitive challenges who have difficulty getting to trial sites. And thirdly, decentralized trials may improve the diversity of participants, for example, those who have socioeconomic challenges and cannot afford to take time off uh, work where they're paid by the hour, cannot afford to employ a uh, child support while, they, while they're away. Uh, obvious advantages for patient convenience, not having to get to trial sites. And then there are other efficiencies. Uh, for example, decentralized trials may avoid the costs associated with travel. Uh, they may reduce the need, the need for physical facilities where trial related activities are conducted. And uh, they may also take advantage of qualified community providers who are doing a good job in clinical practice and may provide useful trial related services as well. And then finally, our experience with COVID-19 has shown that these uh, decentralized approaches are very important to prevent the spread of contagious diseases. Uh, some concerns about remote data co uh, acquisition. Uh, it's important to ensure that there's oversight of trials as uh, trial related activities get delegated to local healthcare providers and others more remote from the investigator, oversight has to be 
carefully planned. Um, there would be potential concerns about device failure. Patient safety is obviously a primary concern if there's any risk to the patient's uh, health by not being close to the investigator site and not having access to other care, then that would not be a suitable environment for a decentralized trial. Uh, patient retention has uh, been a potential problem. Some patients just prefer the regular face-to-face -face visits that they have with their providers, and they may be less interested in engaging through uh, remote technologies. Uh, data privacy is also something that has to be ensured in these decentralized environments. Decentralized clinical trial procedures are not new. Patient diaries and interactive voice response systems have been used for years. Uh, telephone follow-up has been common, particularly long-term follow-up in trials. Uh, in 2016, we published a guidance on electronic informed consent, which allowed consent to be done from patients' homes. In 2014, the first entirely web-based trial was conducted under IND. This was a trial looking at tolteridine for patients with overactive bladder. Uh, about 5,157 patients were registered for the trial. Uh, there were a lot of arduous procedures, including nutrition diaries and numerous uh, urine samples that were needed. And although 456 signed consent, 188 in the placebo run-in, only 18 finally were randomized to treatment. Uh, electronic uh, informed consent was used and uh, patients were randomized to receive tolteridine or placebo over a 12-week period. The outcome was determined using electronic diaries and uh, there were 2.4 less micturition events per 24 hours in the treated arm as opposed to 0.8 micturition uh, events less in the placebo arm. Treatment difference was 1.6 which was not uh, significant uh, statistically. And I think the lesson from that trial was that uh, it was very important to focus on simplicity in um, decentralized trials and make sure that patients can uh, comply with the requirements. COVID-19 was a major impetus to avoid traditional trial site visits. Uh, not having patients report to investigator sites for all the trial related activities was really a critical tool to allow trials to continue during the COVID-19 health emergency. And we wrote a guidance on the conduct of clinical trials of medical products during the COVID-19 public health emergency. The guidance emphasized activities to ensure the safety of participants, including the use of remote visits, direct mailing of investigational products to patients, and techniques to obtain informed consent without in-person contact such as using witnesses and photographs. Some of the strategies to prevent transmission of COVID-19 are no longer needed, but many of the strategies mentioned in the guidance are very important in extending the reach of our trials far beyond the typical demographic into a much more diverse and representative population. Remote trial visits. These are visits that are conducted by the investigator remotely using either video conferencing or telephones, and there are certain challenges that we recognize. First of all, there are local regulations which vary across states and across countries on telemedicine and situations where practitioners are allowed to practice telemedicine across state borders. Uh, physical examinations obviously can't be done when you're doing a remote visit. Video photography may not fully capture the features of a lesion, for example, itch or tenderness. And uh, patient engagement, as I mentioned before, may be a challenge in the absence of in-person in contact. Uh, complex drug, drug administration procedures also probably make uh, these uh, products unsuitable for decentralized trials. And uh, finally, close medical supervision. Uh, if this is needed for infusion reactions or other uh, concerns about the investigational product, then uh, decentralized trial approaches would not be suitable either. Direct distribution of investigational products. Well, the investigator should control the release of products to trial participants. Remember that the investigator is responsible for administering the trial drug. Uh, local state laws differ on direct distribution to patients. Uh, 
Some of them may require locally licensed healthcare professionals or pharmacists to prescribe the investigation product. Uh, packaging and handling are important considerations, particularly when we're dealing with unstable or labile uh, medical products. And finally, plans have to be made for disposable, disposal of unused product. What about the use of local healthcare providers and uh, healthcare facilities? There are resources and qualified healthcare providers in the clinical care environment who may be useful in clinical trials. They may be able to provide trial related data. Delegation of routine clinical activities to patients' local clinics or healthcare providers for routine procedures may be possible, for example, to get x rays, clinical examinations, or lab tests. It would obviously be important to ensure that these individuals who perform these uh, functions are appropriately qualified. Task logs are already used by industry to track events in clinical trials, and these would allow investigators to keep a record of who is doing what. And finally, it would be important to ensure that there's a regular review of data coming from local healthcare providers and local facilities. Electronic informed consent is already in widespread use. It allows patients to review and sign the consent at their homes. Uh, it may allow the provision of videos and graphics to make the process more informative and more easily understood. And of course, important to remember that signed consent must be obtained before enrollment of patients. Home visits are a novel approach. This can be done by either dedicated or contracted trial staff. Um, mobile units are already being developed in mobile vans where both equipment and staff uh, are able to move to areas convenient for patients. And these approaches clearly extend the physical reach of the trial. Uh, digital health technologies, I mentioned this previously, uh, they allow access to continuous or frequent data. They give us the ability to detect sporadic events like seizures, arrhythmias and falls. Uh, they can support patient reported outcomes in real time, sometimes known as ecological momentary assessments. They reflect the effectiveness of the drug in the real world environment, for example, while patients are working, exercising or sleeping. And they can also provide an objective record of functionality. And for more details, I'll refer you to our guidance entitled Digital Health Technologies for Remote Data Acquisition Clinical Investigations, which was published in January this year. As far as oversight of decentralized trials go, uh, the investigators responsible for overseeing the trial the investigator and sub-investigators uh, are uh, should be listed on the form 1572. Uh, local healthcare providers such as radiologists, uh, phlebotomists, nurses, and so on, should be listed on a task log. And then ancillary medical services like emergency room doctors, neighbourhood clinics, and pharmacies are not part of the study staff and are not expected to be listed. As far as safety goes, high-risk products and severe diseases may not be suitable for decentralized clinical trials. It would be important to ensure that patients can contact study staff if they run into a clinical problem. And it's also important to ensure that local medical facilities should be available for urgent care if the patient runs into a problem with adverse events or other trial related issues. What about inspection? A site inspection would generally take place where the data are and where the study staff can be interviewed. Uh, as far as local healthcare providers, local, healthcare, local inspections may be necessary if problems are found and ancillary medical services like um, emergency rooms and neighborhood clinics would generally not be subjected to inspections just as they are not for uh, traditional clinical trials. A couple of other considerations. Um, not everything can be accomplished remotely. Many decentralized trials will end up as hybrids, combinations of remote visits and visits to investigator sites where procedures such as detailed physical exams and other in-person activities are required by the protocol. Supervision, as I mentioned, is important. Local healthcare providers and local facilities need to be supervised by investigators and records need to be available uh, from local health care facilities allowing inspectors to recreate the trial.
I wanted to finish off with a couple of uh, thoughts about trials in clinical practice settings or point of care trials. Uh, these provide the opportunity to use existing clinical infrastructure, particularly when it's supported by interoperable data systems like electronic health records, and this has become an area of increasing interest. Um, the recovery trial in the UK for COVID-19 was the poster trial for, um, for uh, trials in a healthcare setting. In that trial, they reportedly recruited 40,000 COVID patients through the national health system in the UK within the space of six weeks. Quite an extraordinary achievement. And they were able to show the mortality benefit of steroids in treating patients hospitalized with COVID with hypoxia. And uh, this has now become standard practice. Um, practice settings allow engagement of large numbers of patients in short periods of time. And they reflect the effectiveness of treatment in real world environments. And they provide accessibility of clinical trials to patients who wouldn't normally participate. So it leads me to my conclusions, which are that there are important opportunities to improve trial efficiencies, convenience for patients, and the ability to access diverse participants and rare diseases. Electronic technology has broadened the scope of decentralized activities considerably. Contacting FDA, if you're considering an innovative trial designed for a drug specific application, you should contact the relevant review division for a pre-IND meeting. For engagement on digital health technologies or decentralized clinical trial designs that are not related to a specific drug development program, you can contact us at the email address given here, and we will determine the best forum to address this. A couple of questions. First of all, all digital health technologies for use in clinical trials need to be cleared or approved by FDA. Is that true or false? Well, that's false. Only those that qualify as medical devices may need to be approved or cleared. Second, justification of an endpoint as clinically meaningful depends on the DHT used. Is that true or false? That's also false. The meaningfulness of an endpoint is a clinical judgment independent of the method of measurement. For example, fever is a clinically meaningful endpoint regardless of whether you measure it with a digital thermometer or with a mercury thermometer. And lastly, all local healthcare providers participating in a clinical trial would need to be listed on Form 1572, the statement of the investigator. Is that true or false? And that's also false. Only those local healthcare providers with substantial involvement in the trial those whose roles basically rise to the level of a clinical investigator or a sub-investigator should be listed on Form 1572. Uh, good. So uh, that brings us to the end of those two uh, lectures. And I see there are a host of questions in the chat. I'm just going to check with John if you were able to connect. I know you were having a little bit of trouble with your microphone, John. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Bad timing in yep. terms of uh, which. Perfect, loud and clear. Um, you know, I could feel the, clear, the questions. We both have access. Perhaps uh, you would want to just select a couple that you wanted to talk about, and then I can take a couple after that. Uh, certainly. Actually, I was already planning to make a comment, and a couple of questions address the same general issue. Please recognize that what I was focusing on uh, had to do with regulations that apply to drugs and biological products. Uh, there were a couple of questions on devices and our Center for Device and Radiologic Health has done a wonderful job applying uh, the real world evidence uh, approaches to the device space. In fact, I would say if anyone is curious, a simple search of uh, FDA, CDRH and use the, the terms leveraging real world evidence and you'll uh, most likely land on a page that is a great uh, starting point. Uh, they, I know last year there was a, a publication uh, that uh, described, if my memory serves me correct, 90 or so device-related uh, uh, approvals uh, involving real-world data, real-world evidence. Um, Leonard, should I continue and sort of cover um, the evidence space? Yeah. Do you have a follow -up? Why don't you take, take another one and I'll, I'll follow that one. Okay. Um, I think uh, another question, well, actually, it's sort of a combination of questions. Um, I have a few more that are more specific, but I just want to throw it out there early on. 
there's a lot of confusion regarding terminology in general. And I think in part, it depends on our um, education and training. Uh, so uh, please understand there are some regulatory terms, but whether we talk about observational studies or uh, randomized trials, or uh, the bias I was talking about was bias when assessing the drug outcome association. I think one question misunderstood and thought I was suggesting that uh, the, the patient somehow uh, were, were inherently, their measurements might be biased. And there was a related question that says, if RCTs have broader enrollment without so many exclusion of subjects and facilities, they would be real world RCTs. RWE and RCT are not mutually exclusive, close quote on the question. First of all, I couldn't agree more. One of my slides made the explicit point that RWD and RWE are not mutually exclusive. So thank you for the question. But I also think the same inquiry brings up a point that we're focused very often on validity, right? Whether the drug outcome association, the evidence in support of a drug outcome association is valid or not. Uh, in parallel, we could talk about how generalizable the results are. And let me be clear, we said it in the 2022 article that was cited, uh, clinical trials occur in the real world. Uh, what sometimes is pointed out that the more restrictive, the more inclusion exclusion criteria are involved with the trial, maybe in the spirit of validity, uh, the results can become less generalizable. Whereas non-interventional uh, parentheses, observational close parentheses studies have an inherent advantage, not on the validity side, they have a disadvantage, but an advantage in terms of generalizability because the data collected in routine clinical practice uh, doesn't have the same need for informed consent, et cetera. So let me pause there. And uh, I, I've addressed several questions, Leonard. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, John. So I've got a host of really good questions. Uh, I'm going to try and barrel through a couple of them. The first one is about Part 11. Uh, and the question is, DHTs, are they governed by 21 CFR Part 11 for regulatory compliance? And uh, the answer is broadly yes, because uh, Part 11 applies to required records that are either required by our uh, regulations or other regulations. And uh, these incorporate adequate um, uh, clinical records. So uh, by inference, most of the DHT data would uh, be uh, a required record. And I think the things to think about are whether the data that come from the DHT are attributable, which is something that's listed in our, um, our uh, Part 11 regulations. Uh, so we should know where it comes from. There should be security of the data, both in transit and when it's in storage. And there should be electronic mechanisms to prevent any tampering with the data. So I think there are uh, definitely Part 11 considerations. Uh, you can sort of uh, page through the Part 11 requirements and apply them. And we will be hopefully coming out with more guidance on that in the future. I'm going to move on to another question. Uh, the question is what my thoughts are around data that has mixed origins, meaning when some subjects select assessments done in a clinic versus other subjects in the trial selecting to measure remotely using devices to avoid attending clinic visits. Uh, and the questioner says this would allow for subject selection or form of participation. So I think it would uh, very much depend on what was being done. In general, I don't think that we would uh, particularly favor that type of thing because it introduces variability. And some of it may be informed by the treatment allocation. For example, the people who are doing worse in one of the arms may be less inclined to come in for clinical visits than others. And uh, this would create a bias. And perhaps if the measurements were slightly different, you would get the wrong, um, the wrong impression of drug efficacy. So I think in general, there would be a preference not to mix and match, uh, but there may be some very simple procedures where really there's hardly any difference between an assessment done out of the clinic and in the clinic, and uh, maybe those would be suitable. So it would be on a case by case basis. Um, I'm just going to do one more, John, and I'm going to turn it back to you. Here's a question about what do you think about vocal biomarkers obtained from patients' acoustic signals while speaking to be used in clinical trials? Is there ongoing evaluation regarding vocal biomarkers in FDA? And uh, I think it's a great question. I mean, I've seen very fascinating uh, literature on vocal biomarkers for the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and other diseases. There's speech uh, analysis programs for uh, cognitive difficulties and so on and so forth. I think there's a great future for those, but uh, we haven't had experience with them yet. 
Uh, John, you want to take a couple of questions now? Uh, surely. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, one question is uh, indicating that this might be more of a textbook question, but RCTs and meta-analyses are generally the most trusted types of studies when evaluating the literature. Where do RWE studies rank in that aspect? Uh, thank you for the question. And again, I think uh, I would point to one of the slides where uh, I indicated the sort of uh, traditional uh, hierarchies of research design. Uh, that Those hierarchies make sense in that, uh, in general, uh, we appreciate randomization. Actually, I would say an underappreciated aspect of clinical trials is that it's not only the randomization, which is wonderful, but it's that prospective infrastructure that collects high quality data. Uh, so no one's disputing that and clinical trials will not and should not go away. Uh, the question rather is, uh, what do we think of observational, uh, AKA non-interventional studies? And should we have these rigid categories which, where we just dismiss them? Uh, clearly the bar is higher to get a valid drug outcome association uh, result from a, from a study to get valid evidence. But that doesn't mean that in certain areas, and another slide that I had basically indicated if the data are of high quality, if the study design is adequate, and if the regulatory conduct is appropriate, uh, then we can rely on such evidence. And the example of ProGraph uh, to Crolimus, uh is is one of those. So I, I could also point out, and, and those who work with trials appreciate this, right? If we have a very small trial uh, that uh, is imbalanced in terms of baseline characteristics and has a uh, marginal outcome or an outcome that's difficult to measure, uh, it's still a randomized trial, but there's a gradation of, of confidence in the, uh, in the quality of the results and the uh, rigor of the results. So all we're trying to say is that while hierarchies are interesting to look at, uh, the responsibility of FDA is to say, based on the data and the uh, corresponding evidence that are generated, uh, do we think that our standards for substantial evidence or confirmatory evidence, as the case may be, have been met? So I hope that answers that question. Uh, Leonard, since I took a long time, do you want to, uh, on that one question, do you want to take the next one or should I uh, look for one more? Uh, sure, I'll go, for, I'll go for a couple more. Um, the question here says, uh, do decentralized trials work well with medical devices? Uh, it seems like they certainly might. Um, medical devices are often, often explored in, uh, 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 outside of clinical sites and using a digital health technology to figure out whether a medical device is working properly is uh, very feasible. And our uh, guidance on digital health technologies is uh, written both by uh, the Center for Drugs, Biologics and Devices, so it definitely applies. Um, another question, um, did I understand the statement correctly? Digital health technologies do not need to be cleared as medical devices, even though the DHT may aid in the diagnosis of a disease. Uh, I think this is a discussion that's probably best uh, had with uh, representatives of the Center for uh, Devices. But uh, the broad answer is that um, there is a, there's, there's a statutory definition of a device and if the device as it's being used in the clinical trial or if the DHT as it's being used in the clinical trial uh, conforms to that definition, then it would be regulated and would have to be cleared. On the other hand, there are many, di many uh, devices that are not used uh, as devices and uh, although they may play a role in the diagnosis, they would not necessarily be cleared. I mean, we know that accelerometers are used a lot in Parkinson's and other disease disorders. Uh, they may be used to establish the baseline severity for entry into a trial and so on. And that on its own would not uh, uh, constitute the definition of a device, a medical device. But again, I would refer you to the, uh, the regulations. Um, I'm going to do one more, John, and then I'll hand it over to you again. In decentralized trials, are assessments performed outside of the investigator site considered a separate site? Or can you have a single site, a single site decentralized trial? Uh, so again, I think it depends about what you consider a site. We would not consider patients' home sites. We would not consider uh, community clinic sites. I think the important concept is that the site is really the area under the, that falls under, or at least the uh, the activities that fall under the jurisdiction of the investigator. If the investigator is in charge of a patient, 
and some of the activities for the trial take, patients, uh, take place at the patient's home, the site would be considered the investigator's site. Uh, so let me stop there. John, hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Leonard. Another question is asking about um, uh, the future scope of real world evidence in clinical settings with high comorbidity or, or high mortality outcomes. That's actually an interesting question. I think what I'll do with that is point out sort of what FDA is seeing, at least in, in CEDAR and CBER. Uh, at the end of the day, again, it's about the uh, appropriateness of the data, the adequacy of the study design. So I would say with regard to comorbidity, that becomes a challenge with real world data sources. We don't fault clinicians for doing the best job possible and the, the measurements might be accurate at the bedside, but are they sufficient for the level of granularity we need uh, to be able to make sure that we're making an apples to apples comparison be between the treated and the comparator groups, if, if you follow a uh, link to my, my presentation. Uh, regarding mortality as an outcome, uh, going from a baseline characteristic to an outcome, that's interesting, I'll flip that around. Uh, in, and this uh, actually overlaps with Leonard's presentation where he had a slide of endpoints. Uh, if it's mortality, well, one could appreciate that we have higher confidence with the real world data set to accurately uh, identify mortality, say, versus uh, a, a subjective self-reported outcome, which could be uh, asked in a myriad of ways at the bedside or, or anything in between. So what this question really uh, indicates is that at the end of the day, it's a case by case assessment. Uh, but again, we are honoring the 21st Century Cures uh, congressional mandate and our producer commitment to say that we are willing to consider studies involving real world data that generate real world evidence uh, for regulatory purposes. But it's the same evidentiary standard, which is one of my take home messages. I'll follow up with a, a quick second question that's somewhat, re somewhat, relate, somewhat related. Has COVID been responsible for accelerating the use of real world evidence? The answer to that would probably be yes, but not as much as some people seem to think. As, as I indicated, FDA was already evaluating the use of real world data and real world evidence. And much of what we're talking about today was already in the pipeline well before the unfortunate onset of the pandemic. Uh, all of us are for sure aware of good and, and not so good examples in the, in the press of so-called real world evidence uh, that have been generated during the pandemic. Uh, but we certainly should take advantage of available data. And we're starting to see some quote unquote RWE uh, assessments of say vaccine efficacy uh, with different uh, uh, virus, uh, uh, you know, uh, evolution uh, as well as uh, different vaccine penetration, et cetera. So having said that, there, there does seem to be a mistaken impression that nothing much would have happened in the RWE space if not for COVID, but we're certainly gaining from lessons learned uh, unfortunately, during, due to the pandemic. Thanks, Leonard. Thanks. Uh, we've just got one minute. I'm going to try and squeeze in another question. Uh, can you comment on the responsibility, if any, that a DCT software solution provider may have in monitoring for potential adverse events? Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's an excellent question. We've discussed it a lot. Uh, obviously, uh, it would be unreasonable to expect either the software provider or um, uh, a sponsor or an investigator to monitor a patient 24 hours a day. Uh, so the, the novelty is that many of these digital health technologies can pick up uh, serious events uh, 24 hours a day. So things like arrhythmias or hypoglycemia. Uh, in practice, we would expect the same sort of approach to be taken as in taken with traditional trials. In other words, if the patient experiences an adverse event, they should have access to urgent medical attention, either through a local emergency room or local providers. And um, the I think the other important uh, feature is that it should be very clear in the informed consent what sort of attention the patient might expect if an adverse event occurs on a... Um, uh, during a continuous uh, sort of uh, DHT monitoring program. Uh, the protocol should also be very clear in indicating what sort of responses and what sort of time frame for responses the, uh, the investigator uh, will be responding to these things. So I think uh, we've probably run out of time and I know uh, we need a little bit of time for a break. So I'm going to thank John very much for his help in this uh, presentation, this session. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, we'll be taking a 10-minute break. Uh, 
and then we'll regroup for our last session of the course. Thank you.